Hi, I'm Kristen, and this is the Simple Handmade Everyday Podcast where I talk about living a creative, intentional life. I like to chat about quilting, sometimes knitting, and cross-stitching now, what I'm reading and watching, and a little bit about self-care, productivity, and keeping a cozy, organized home. I've got my cup of tea in hand, so grab yours and let's settle in for a chat. This is episode 97. Hello. Hello, friends. How are you? I did not mean to be away for so long. Um, My last episode was before Thanksgiving, so the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year have come and gone. And um, once a holiday's over, I like, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. So there won't be (laughs) much of a holiday wrap up here, but it was all good. The kids were home for both holidays. Um, Ben, my college kid, was home for a full month. As a matter of fact, at this very moment, my husband is driving him back to, to school. And um, so I have the house to myself for a little while. This seemed like a perfect time to to do a podcast. So we we had some just great family time. Um, One of the kids was sick the entire time. Um, He was home and that was a bit of a bummer. And um, we just got him actually to the urgent care before he he left um, and got some antibiotics. And I guess he's doing better now. So, you know, that just puts a little different lens on things when one person isn't feeling good. It also rained a lot here in Southern California. Um, We are not experiencing in Southern California the flooding and and all the terrible things that are happening up in Northern California, thank goodness. Um, But it has been so nice to have some rain. Man, it has been so long. So that was was, uh, definitely, you know, it was fun. If you do want a little bit uh, of a more of a kind of a new year wrap up, um, my friend Francis and I, we've got the, the Empty Nest Chronicles blog. I'll put a link in the show notes. And we did a holiday podcast episode. We will probably, our plan is to podcast once a month for that on, on the Empty Nest Chronicles side of things, which is all about two friends just talking about uh, this this season of life and, and all the changes and transitions it uh, it throws at us. So we um, talk about the the holidays and what we want um, about the new year in the podcast, what we want, what we want to do. Um, Francis likes to ask these insightful questions about, you know, what, what, what do you want to be different? And how do you want to feel in the new year? And I'm just like, what are the things I can check off my list? So um, I think we balance each other out very well in that way. So um, yeah, I, I'm just going to keep the intro short on this because, um, you know, it's been a long time since my last podcast and I've got some things that I want to talk to you about. Oh, but before we do that, I want to talk about my cup of tea because I'm enjoying it so much. It was a Christmas gift from my daughter and it's Harney and Sons. They are my fave. Black currant or currant, depending how you want to say that. Um, juicy and aromatic with sweet black currants. Where's the description? Um, oh, it doesn't really give me a great description on this one. Um, but it is wonderful. It's a black tea and it's just got, I guess it's the, the sweet, <laughs> juicy black currants in it that just um, give it a little bit of a, of a different um, take than just black tea. And I've been drinking it all week and it's wonderful with just a little splash of milk in it. I have been loving that. So that's Harney and Sons Black Currant or Currant Tea. Before we get into the quilty stuff, I'd like to take this time to thank the Fat Quarter Shop for sponsoring the podcast The Fat Quarter Shop is a one-stop show for quilting fabrics and supplies for quilters around the world. They stock quilt shop quality fabrics, pre-cuts, quilt kits, patterns, notions, and even cross-stitch supplies. And one thing that the Fat Quarter Shop does so well is quilt-alongs. So um, they are inviting you to join them in the 2023 Bountiful Quilt and Stitch Along. A lot of these they do that are are both a quilt and a a cross-stitch project, which is really fun. And this um, is a charity quilt-along and stitch along to benefit the Make-A-Wish of Central and South Texas. They do this every year and they raise a ton of money for them. This is a bright sampler quilt overflowing with Spring's Bounty and it was designed by Corey Yoder featuring her fabric collection Sunwashed from Moda Fabrics. There's, as I said, also a lovely cross-stitch pattern as well. So this is how the fundraiser works. Is um, Fat Quarter Shop offers the Bountiful Patterns as free downloads during this event for a suggested donation of $10 each, or you can make a one-time donation to the Make-A-Wish of Central and South Texas. Um, 
no amount is too big or too small. Every bit counts. So it was just really, it's about the, the charity side of this. And from February through September, they will publish a new pattern on the Jolly Jabber blog on the first Friday of every month. So if you want to make a quilt just like the Fat Quarter Shop, you can reserve a quilt kit right now. Um, and they expect it to ship here in January. I didn't even check if that was already shipping. So you might want to get involved in that. It's for a great cause. I've done them in the past. And um, they're also releasing information for the design mystery block of the month quilt along and I'll just put a link to the Jolly Jabber quilt along section and um, which is that's their blog and then they're, they're doing so many I'm going to talk about another one that I'm participating in a little bit later um, but they just um, offer so many quilt alongs which help you just feel that 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 feeling of community when everyone is making the same quilt and I think that's so fun so as always I will put a link in the show notes Okay, let's talk quilting, which admittedly is still a little bit on the theoretical side for me because I took apart my sewing room um, so that we could use it for, well, Thanksgiving dinner. I did put it together again after that, but then for Christmas dinner, and then I put a puzzle on it thinking, okay, I'm going to have this puzzle out. It was This was during Christmas. Um, I got my husband a puzzle of Balboa Park in San Diego because all our kids live in San Diego. And um, a lot of times we put a card table out in the family room and then everybody kind of stops by and, and works a little bit on it. But I put it on the dining room table because it was just a little bit more out of the way and we still had the tree up and everything. And it was a terrible mistake because the dining room's too out of the way and hardly anybody has worked on the puzzle, but it's too far along to like get rid of it so I don't know what I'm gonna do my sewing room is now the puzzle room but um while I had it set up I did sew the Dorothy block um from my friend Francis over at um the Quilt Fiction podcast so let me tell you a little bit about what's going on over there Francis if if you've ever listened to the Fil Quilt Fiction podcast Francis is a, a wonderful writer and um a couple years ago probably more than a couple years ago <laughs> now that I think about it she wrote this great story called Friendship Album 1933 where she um wrote she we kind of went along with the on the journey with her as she was writing each chapter then she would record it as a podcast um and she was just like maybe only a couple chapters ahead so we were just like with her for the journey um and that was an amazing story about this group of um you know an unlikely group of women in the 1930s that form a quilting bee and they are all sewing quilts for the um world's fair um co quilting contest and so um, that has been out for years, um, but she has, is writing the follow-up. Well, before I even say that, she publishes a Christmas story every year from the perspective of one of these wonderful women. And this year, it was Dorothy. And um, Dorothy in the story, it's a short Christmas story, is making a quilt. And so um, Frances released the pattern for that quilt block and um and i made one and several people made them and it was just it was very fun the, the story is free it's up on the quilt fiction podcast and you can download the block as well so when i sat down to sew this i was very excited to sit down and actually piece a block and i was having this crazy intermittent problem with my sewing machine with my juki like it's on but when I press the pedal it just doesn't go now this happened to me once before and I took it all the way like 45 minutes to the dealer just to find out that the little lever for when you're winding a bobbin had been pushed <laughs> so you know your um your needle doesn't go up and down when you're winding a bobbin and I was so glad at that point I didn't even mind that I'd driven <laughs> 45 minutes because I didn't want my sewing machine to be broken um, so that was the first thing I checked and actually it took me a while. I'm like, this happened before. What was it? But I tried everything and um, it was just kind of intermittent. So I just got frustrated and let it go, sat down after dinner and it worked and I got through the whole block. And then I sat down another day to sew. Um, I was just going to repair a dog bed that the dog had chewed a hole in and it didn't work. And so I brought out my baby lock to do that. And then I sat down to sew another day and it did work. So I, it needs service. Um, because it's I don't I don't know what's going on with it but that had put a, a damper on my enthusiasm so I will put a link over to the the um, quilt fiction podcast so you can check all that out but what is actually super cool is Francis um over you know from quilt fiction has launched um a membership site called the story guild and she is currently 
um, writing and recording as a, in podcast format the follow-up story called Forget Me Not, which is like the next year in the in the story of these same women from Friendship Album. And um, I have, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to read some of the things she's, she's written and, and she's already dropped a couple episodes and it's a wonderful story very much in the same vein and you will love it so in order to get access to this story um, you need to be a member of the story guild and there is a free level of the story guild where you will get certain um, certain things from her certain stories things like that and and notifications of what's going on there's a monthly membership if you just wanted to try it um and then a yearly membership which is um, highly worth it in my from my perspective so she's um dropping the podcast you know it's like an audiobook episodes of the forget me not you know the next in the friendship album as well as she is writing a modern quilt story of of uh this this the story of Marnie and she's retired and she's a quilter and her husband in his retirement has decided to take up quilting and um there you know it, it's not all uh, smooth sailing when you and your husband have the same um, hobby perhaps <laughs> so anyways there's so much great content over there I will put a link in the show notes and definitely just go go check it out um, I think that it will be worth it. Oh, and the reason I bring all, a lot of this up is they are doing a quilt along of a sampler quilt, very much in the style that these women in the 1930s would be doing. I've seen the quilt. It's beautiful. Um, and um, so you might want to check that out as well. If you're a hand piecer, it is the perfect type of quilt to hand piece because these women would have most likely hand piece. There were some sewing machines, but... Um, but most of these women are hand piecers, so um, they're they're doing a wonderful um, quilt along um, called uh, what's the name of the quilt? He loves me, he loves me not. So definitely check that out. So in terms of getting me back sewing, my friend Deanna Sanzano, who is my long armor, made the suggestion that we do a quilt along for the only one pattern. She also has it's been wanting to do it. It's the pattern that I have that. Um, I would like to use um, to make uh, use up my fabric for a Christmas quilt that are that's a pa that's panels like because I never never know how to use panels and and very large prints are pan or panels are perfect for this and um, I think I may do that but I'm I'm gonna um, put that aside for a while because um, well <laughs> selfishly because it's a Christmas quilt for me and I am so over Christmas right now so like maybe that might be a good summertime thing to do that whole Christmas in July thing so I'm thinking about that but what is going to get me off my duff here as I'm grabbing it is the um so scrappy spools quilt along um with the fat quarter shop um that is starting this month um I think it there's going to be some more information information on like January 12th I believe I have the pattern and um, I'll put a link in the show notes it's, it's by Lori Holt and it just looks so fun so the idea of this quilt is that each um, spool it's 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 just it's a whole uh, one block in a way of, of spools um, that that are uh, set on its side or up and down um, and inside each bowl where your thread would be is a different kind of traditional quilt block um, I was looking at them seeing if I could tell you the names of them I see a pinwheel I see like a tulip block one is just straight up patchwork one's an American flag one I know there's a different name for it but it kind of looks like an Ohio star but one of the triangles overlaps or some flying geese there's you know just like your your standard ad adorable patchwork blocks so those blocks finish at five inches and then once you put the spool top and bottom on side on the sides that is um then it comes out to be an eight inch block and so there'll be a quilt along and then she tells you in the pattern you know there's 16 different patchwork blocks you know that are the center of the spool and um, it's bigger than I want it to be. I'm a throw quilt girl. The finish size is seven, 72 and a half by 90 and a half. So I did some quick figuring the other day. I think it's a, um, I should open this. I think it's a seven by nine setting. I think I could go six by eight, which means I would make 15 less blocks. Um, and there are 16 blocks. So I could, you know, basically just make one less block for almost all the blocks. So um, yeah, so I'm excited about this. It's definitely, it's a, 
it's a scrappy uh, it's a scrappy quilt I'm gonna use my stash with the exception of I want you know consistent fabrics for the spool ends which are you know kind of a brown at first I was thinking about Moda grunge um, I thought that would look good but then I started thinking about the line from Robin Pickens called thatched um, actually the, my last hand pieced quilt long quilt I completely made in thatched and I loved it it's just a great tone on tone um, fabric I think that would look so great I just I need to it's so hard for me to buy fabric online sometimes because there's two colors of brown or maybe there might even be three but I'm, I'm down to two and I'm just not sure which one is right so and then I kind of want to do a low volume background now Lori Holt is the queen of long of, of low volume backgrounds and she uses two different ones in this quilt there is background fabric in um, you know in the quilt in, in each block so you know you've got the spool ends that make it eight inches and then on the sides we have to fill in those two so she uses I think a consistent low volume for that and then there's sashing and she uses a different low volume there I think I'm gonna get one low volume and again I was looking online and I was just like I wanted to be very low volume <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and as you're looking online I'm just like is that is that color too much I don't know but I think I might go with it's like a um, uh, a white with uh, like aqua dots irregular dots it's a Lori Holt I forgot what it's called but I, I think that's what I'm gonna go with and I think I'm gonna go with the thatched so I need to get that stuff ordered so that I can start making the quilt but in the meantime I can make as a matter of fact I don't have to rush it all now that I think about it because I think you kind of put the spool ends at the end so I can make the blocks no problem now oh I just worked that out right now with you guys thank you very much <laughs> so um, definitely I'm excited about that and I'm gonna be super bummed if my sewing machines not working so I need to sort my sewing room which might completely change this year um, more on that later when when we've made some decisions but I, I might be moving my sewing room which would make me super happy the other quilt along I wanted to mention is um, my friend Sherry uh, McConnell over at a quilting life she is doing she does a yearly um, block of the month mystery mystery block of the month um, sew along and I'll put a link in the show notes you know I just love everything that she does and the the, the January block is already up and I I remember correctly it's like an Ohio star with this little patchwork thing going through it it's super cute um, so and she has an amazing supportive community over there so if you're not doing that you might consider that as well and while we're talking about Sherry I wanted to bring up the fact that I found out that Martingale the publisher is going out of business Martingale I'm so bummed about this because they publish some of my very favorite books um, you know all the the Books that come from the Moda people, including Sherry. Um, they have just a great selection of books. Photography is beautiful. They're just really well done, but they are going out of business. So I will put a link in the show notes, but there is a, um, a huge sale going on as they try to get rid of their inventory. And I was perusing it the other day, and um, I've talked about uh, Sherry McConnell's quilting planner which is so much more than a planner it's just it's full of she is such a great organizer it's full of organizational advice memory keep places for memory keeping all kinds of things um, and it is on sale over there right now for under ten dollars for nine ninety so you just you know may want to take this opportunity to um, pick up many of the the you know I've talked about many Martingale books um, from Pat Sloan's um, Tantalizing Table Toppers, Sunday Best Quilts. There's just a ton of them over there. So definitely go check that out. I also received the most amazing package from Aliso during my little break here. And um, my love for Aliso irons is um, <laughs> well stated on this podcast. I have the big smart iron. I have the little um, craft iron, the mini iron, which is so great to keep on a wool mat um, right next to your sewing machine to just quickly press blocks to keep going without having to get up and go over to like the big ironing board, depending on how you were set up. Um, and I wrote a whole, I will put a link in the show notes. I put a whole, wrote a whole review about, um, Aliso irons. And let me just quickly tell you a couple of the things I love about them. Very long cords. I love the lift thing on the Aliso iron where you can keep it, um, 
horizontal and then it just pops up. I think everybody knows that. I've never had that break on me. I've had my Elisa irons for years now. And um, also you can just use tap water um, for steam as opposed to having to keep a jug of distilled water around. They're obviously very hard, very hot, great with steam. You don't have to use steam. So I just... Um, Oh, and they stay on for 30 minutes without shutting off. So these are all wonderful things about Aliso irons. But they're kind of getting into um, iron accessories now. And um, first of all, they have an adorable um, ironing board cover in all these colors that match their irons, which they've got. So there's like a yellow and a pink and a turquoise and an orchid, which is a purple. Um, I have the yellow one. I have a yellow iron and I have a pink iron. And it's just, it's beautiful. It's a mustardy yellow. It's very thick. Absolutely love the ironing board cover. And they have um, these storage bags for irons. And they have one for their smart iron and one for their, their, their mini like craft iron. I've got them sitting here right now. They're made of felt. And um, as I was putting my iron in it, I was thinking it's almost like a little mailbox. It's the shape of an iron and it just has a little, on the back side, a little... Um, zipper the sort of arch shaped that that comes down and you just slip your iron right in there you don't have to have an aliso iron they fit most standard iron sizes for the big one and um you know mini iron or craft irons for the small one and so if you go to um you know retreats or you travel or whatever these are so perfect to to protect your iron and since i am a person has to kind of move in and out of my craft my sewing space especially the ironing board side um, and i always feel just like a little weird you know throwing this the iron somewhere um I, this is going to be such a great way to protect it so and uh, so they're this beautiful dark gray felt um it's it's lovely now and they have handles so it's just easy to move around and they even have a little little hole little peak toe a little hole in the front where if you use the um silicone uh silicone how do i say that word um sole plate where you can just set your iron down um and it has this little pointy end it sticks right out so it's like it's so perfect for aliso irons but also your other irons so love those things but here's the thing i also really want to talk to you about is they've gotten into the wool pressing mat business which is so perfect for them so the it's called the pro press link what's cool about this well first of all it's 100 percent new zealand wool it is um 14 by 14 which is so it's a square and 14 inches is the um the width of a standard ironing board and what is different about their um wool mats how thick is it here it doesn't say but it looks like it is probably a half to three quarters inch thick so there are in the corners there's these little holes drilled in the mat and it comes with what i imagine i'm sure are little silicone protectors actually i don't know that they're silicone um can, did i say protectors i meant connectors so what you can do is you can link up your your mats and they won't slip apart because you just put these little connectors in and it holds them together so i tried it out on mine i have two of these which is a very nice size on the ironing board it would take three to get the most of the length of the ironing board but as i said before you can put um the you know like these wool mats like right next to your sewing machine and to sew or to to you know as you're sewing then you can press right there and so you can create as big of one as you want like if you had a big for instance if you had a big table you know I know a lot of people kind of build bigger um, ironing boards you could um, you could link you know four in a row or you could do four in a square you could so you just have this all these ways of connecting these um, 14 by 14 wool pressing mats to make this the the um pressing space that you know works best for you and if you've never used a wool pressing mat they really do make a difference i was trying to think of a way to describe why and here it is on the the paperwork here wool's natural insulation properties reflect heat pressing the pieces from both sides and that's what i wanted to say is that you press on the top but that sinks into the 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 wool and so it's it's getting that underside just as hot and if you use these in um conjunction with a tailor's clapper um you know that piece of wood that you set on on top of a uh, <laughs> like a block after you've sewn it 
and then that absorbs the heat and things are just so so flat and I'm also I'm now that I see that this is it's a half inch thick I see that on the on the paperwork here so um, you you know you can use steam or not um, I usually don't use steam with a wool pressing mat I've heard that when you use steam that with other wool pressing mats I haven't done it with this one that they can get that kind of that funky wool smell when it gets wet but this says you can you can do that so this I'm absolutely loving um, wool pressing mats and I think you should definitely check it out of course always a link in the show notes and thank you Aliso for sending me these amazing goodies okay let's move on to cross stitch uh, I because my sewing room has been taken apart and the fact that I'm still obsessed I did do a lot of cross stitching it's just so easy I have to say that um, sitting down you know after dinner we do the dishes um, maybe go for a walk um, get ready for bed I'm one of those people that get ready for bed like I'm ready for bed at 7 p.m. <laughs> And I just curl up on the couch or my chair with my cross stitch project and my earbuds in and some, you know, British <laughs> mystery or something. And I am happy for the next couple hours. So it's just, it's so easy for me to, to just have that. I've really fallen into that routine. So over Christmas, I had bought the Prairie Schooler. Um, it's called a Merry Mini Surprise. So in the cross stitch world, um, Prairie Schooler Santas are kind of famous. They do one every year and people go back and stitch the old ones. You know, this is Prairie Schooler Santa 1984. But um, I bought a little pattern that has one, two, has eight small ones. So they're, um, well, it depends on the size, but uh, of, of your cloth, but they're, you know, two or three inches tall. No, more than two inches, three, or, let's just say four inches tall. And I stitched up a couple of those, and my idea was that I was going to just turn them into little pillows, um, and and have you know them in this dough bowl. I got a dough bowl for Christmas, which is a um, I don't know how let's say it's 18 inches by six. I think it's the the true reason for them is to shape as uh, you know like loaves of bread um, as they rise but they are also used in home decor so it's a long kind of skinny thing and it was hand made so it's a little rough looking I absolutely love it and it's a great way to just um, display some of these little cross stitch uh, pillows that I am making and plan on making more of so I made two Santas I did not get around to making them into little pillows this year but I did enjoy stitching them um, I did one on uh, my, my favorite which is uh, 25 count Lugana and I had purchased when um, Fat Quarter Shop was having so many sales over the holidays I had stuff on my wish list I just keep a running wish list on the Fat Quarter Shop and I highly recommend it um, so that you can you know you don't have to keep it in your head the things that you'd like and then when they go on sale you know they're all in one place so I wanted to experiment with some different cross stitch cloths so I have you know I have some 14 count um, I've learned that I really like 25 count Lugana but I wanted to try some 28 count Lugana and venture into the world of linen so I bought some 32 count linen so one of the the Santas here I did on 25 count and that was you know comfort zone the other one I did on 28 count and that is just 28 little holes in an inch for those of you that aren't sure what that means um, and so when you stitch two over two the size of the piece comes out just as if you had stitched it on 14 count like Ada and I was actually very surprised at how much harder I found it to stitch on 28 count I'm to the point now with 25 count that I, I don't need a magnifier and I'm glad I do have my halo go light um, from daylight which I do like but it's just um, I don't have a great setup to have that I, I kind of need to be sitting like at a table to really make that worth it and it is very nice for um, I use the light on low and it's very nice to look through the magnifier uh, it makes it very easy but it's not as cozy as just stitching on the couch so um, but so I've gotten to the point where I can with the with the light at the table right next to me you know the end table on the couch I can see 20 Five count fine 28 was a lot harder I gotta say and then I um, so I, I it'll be fine I'll you know I finished it and I will use uh, 28 in, in the future but I was I, I need better light and magnification for that so then I 
I pulled out the 32 count linen to try this other little thing that I bought and gave to my husband and said, put this in my Christmas stocking. It is from Plum Street Samplers and it's um, a little chart called Autumn Cottage. How big is this when it's done? Um, I should, it's uh, 97 um, stitches wide by 66 high and nowhere does this say how big it is, but it's, I don't know, I'm going to say it's going to be um, four inches high and seven inches wide. So it's just, it's an, again, one of the like, and I will do a little, make it in just a little pillow probably. And it's very old fashioned looking. It's a, you know, like an old fashioned sampler with a house. I, I love, there's so many great charts out there with houses and, and this is, um, so this is my first one like that. And I tried this on the 32 count linen and I gave up like within 15 minutes. Oh my gosh. Thir if, if I found 28 count hard, 32 count, even more so obviously and it's linen so it's a little irregular so I will have to grow up and grow into that a little bit but so now I am stitching Autumn Cottage on 28 count no 25 count Lugana and I am very much enjoying enjoying that stitch so I'm alternating between that and um, the Lori Holt flea market flowers which I've been stitching on for ages and will continue to take me ages no rush um, and so just going back and forth so also with the Plum Street sampler I bought it as a kit as you can do Fat Quarter Shop now has this thing where um, it w when you buy a chart for a lot of charts maybe not every single one it lists all the floss that you need and with a click of the button you can just say select all and add to my cart so I just got all of all the so it just sort of was a whole kit for me and it is my first venture into fancy floss and fancy floss is hand dyed floss so it's a little bit um, variegated very slightly variegated and you stitch with it well uh, Kimberly over at Fat Quarter Shop does not stitch differently with it, um, but you are supposedly supposed to stitch differently with it so that you see more of the var variegation. Like for instance, you are not supposed to use the loop method, um, but just take two pieces of floss right next to each other. I love the loop method, so I am continuing to use the loop method, but the other thing they want you to do when you use Fancy Floss is stitch one X at a time versus my normal method of like doing a whole row of half stitches and then coming back. And um, Kimberly has shown many examples of her stitching with the same floss versus um, this woman, Cheryl from the Fat Quarter Shop, who is kind of their pro cross stitcher. And Cheryl always uses, she doesn't use the loop method. She always stitches one X at a time. And Cheryl definitely gets a lot more of a variegated look. So I'm kind of halfway in between on this. Um, when I get to the roof of this house, which is a gray, I may um, not use the loop method, but use two strands right next to each other. Um, I just hate the how much work it is to um, anchor that the floss when you do it that way. But um, yeah, so that's, um, I, I'm just excited to kind of be, uh, you know, upping my game a little bit um, in cross stitch by trying some different fabrics and um, finally trying to uh, using some some fancy floss. That quarter shop also sent me a few fun goodies like the Lori Holt unstitcher. And uh, I'll be honest with you, at first I thought, I don't know if this is a really, a I mean, it's not a necessary thing. It's definitely a fun luxury thing. Um, and what that is, it's a way to uh, unpick your cross stitch. Now you're like, can't you just use a needle? Yes, you can use a needle. Um, and that's what everybody has always done. But Lori Holt made this little thing and it's just got kind of a little bit of a thicker needle and a handle. Um, the whole, I don't have it in front of me, but the whole thing is only about two inches long. Um, but you know, I have to unpick, I make mistakes. And having a handle to hold on to and a very firm, kind of a little bit of a thicker kind of pointy thing to pull out stitches is actually makes it a lot easier. So um, if you're interested in something like that, I, I give the Lori Holt unstitcher a, a thumbs up. They also sent me the cutest chicken needle minder. There's a whole, Lori Holt has designed a whole, um, I think it's a, it's going to be a monthly type uh, cross stitch pattern 
thing with all with chickens. I'm not planning on doing that, but the chicken minder, the chicken needle minder, super cute. They also sent me some charts that I will, that are all Christmas related. And as I've discussed, I'm over Christmas, but maybe again, like in July or something when I'm doing a Christmas in July thing, um, I will give these away. I have the cookie cutter ornaments from Fat Quarter Shop, which are very cute. You could turn them, you can do whatever you want with them, but they um, are made to be little round ornaments. And there's a snowman and presents and rain reindeer and a sleigh and a gingerbread house all that little ornaments so many so so cute so I'll be giving those away as well as the typeface series I've talked about these in the past I now have the Rudolph one um, and and it's like half um, the the reindeer face and then it's very cute and it's it's Rudolph she's got the red nose and then it um, in word says Dasher Dancer Prancer Vixen all the way down to to Rudolph and so I'll be giving these uh, more holiday ones away a little bit later on oh and there's also a super cute little fall one with a fox um, and so so that'll be coming up uh, a little bit later very quickly, I wanted to touch on knitting. I have worked on my elementary wrap a little bit. My friend Pam and I have started a monthly pub knitting get together. Um, we have this place in our town where there is, it's called the Alley and there is like a little craft brewery and there's a, a uh, like a winery. And so we met the first time at the little brewery, which was well lit and very nice. And we had a great time pub knitting there. And then um, over the Christmas break, we brought our daughters and we went to, who are both over 21, and we went to this beautiful little, again, little winery that has several little areas inside that look like living rooms. And so Chloe brought her crochet and um, Pam's daughter brought her cross stitch and she scoped out right under the light from the beginning and I don't blame her because you need light to cross stitch and I my the elementary wrap is just knit 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 and purl 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 I thought it would be no problem even in the in the dark basically and at one point I realized there's a hole there's a hole in my knitting and I just kept going and I'm hoping I can just drop one stitch down and and fix it but I'm like once I put that away from that diet I'm like I'm afraid to look at that because if you have to pull out rows you know it's like over a hundred stitches wide I'm just oh, I don't want to do that so we'll see but I do have two books that I will review I think I said this last time but I'm going to push it off one more podcast because um, I really want to dive into these books one is the uh, Lopapasia sweater which is um, a yoked sweater from Iceland um, kind of very fair isle looking and I can't wait to uh, get more into that book and then I also um, have this book they sent me called Knitting Wraps in the Round 21 inspired shawls, stoles, and scarves. So I will get into, um, I mean, I want to really read these and then talk to you about them um, in, a, in a future podcast. Let's move on to books. Wow, there's there was some reading going on. You'll find out there was a lot more TV watching <laughs> than reading. But um, a World of Curiosities, Louise Penny's 18th book came out, out at the end of November. I had pre-ordered it and I absolutely love how it just drops into my Kindle at, since I'm on the West Coast at 9 p.m. because I think it, it drops at midnight <clears throat> or one minute after on the East Coast. And so that's nine o'clock for me. I actually um, missed it this time. <laughs> so I started it the next day. I always get the the Kindle version and then do the add-on for the Audible so I can switch back and forth depending on what I'm doing between the audiobook and reading. And it is definitely in the top three of my favorite uh, Inspector Gamache books. It was wonderful. I don't want to get into any type of spoilers, but I, I have a few things to say about it. First of all, it definitely brings back characters and things that happened in previous books. So I do think that the Inspector Gamache series is best read in order because of uh, overarching um, storylines, um, characters coming back from previous books, things like that. So that is what I would say about that. So this book is set back in Three Pines. You know, they're not always in Three Pines. So I, I do love that. And it brings in some new characters. And I was like, wow, like um, Myrna's niece, Harriet, is in this one. We hadn't met her before. And there's definitely, there's there's new characters. And um, so that's that's kind of fun and refreshing. What's also really fun is you get to find, uh, you get to go back to the original case where Inspector Gamash meets his um 
his number one, which is Jean Guy Beauvoir. So um, it the the whole book kind of goes back and forth between two time periods, and so it is so fun to see them before they knew each other, and so that that was very fun. I love the whole you know I I kind of like the the two different timelines on it. It also does um, talk about this real life event that happened, and I went and Googled it <laughs> when I when I read it. I'm like, was this a real thing? In Montreal in 1989, there was a massacre at the Ecole Polytechnique, which is a, like an engineering college, and 14 women were massacred um, by an anti-feminist who didn't think that there was uh, women should not be engineers, and so there's that is referenced in it. But um, it's you know it's everything you want a, a Louise Penny Inspector Gamache book to be. Are we still call him Inspector Gamache. He's been so much more than Inspector for so long. Um, but so that is the world of curiosities. Highly recommend one of my favorites, and that's saying something. On a definitely lighter side, I discovered um, probably honestly through like a Facebook ad. Um, Facebook really knows my my cozy mystery reading, and I would say Louise Penny books are not cozy mysteries; they are a higher level than that. Um, but this, these are what I'm about to talk about are definitely lightweight cozy mysteries. It's called the Spice Town Mysteries, and um, I've read two maybe three I can't even remember yet they're inexpensive Kindle reads um and it takes place in this little um town called Spice Town which is actually not named for the spices but from the founder whose last name was Spicer but they really play it up with all the streets are like nutmeg and I don't know fennel or something (laughs) um but it centers around the mayor of Spice Town which is this um older woman and um and her friendship with the chief of police and um so you know it's just your typical cozy mystery something happens she sticks her nose in although and uh, with an unusual twist i will say that he welcomes her input <laughs> as opposed to always fighting with her about it and saying to stay in your own lane so um th- theirs is a very fun friendship and that's it's, it's just like a very nice i'm trying to fall asleep and don't want anything too deep <laughs> <laughs> type of read so that's what um that was fun and of course during december i um reread slash re-listened to winter solstice by rosamund pilcher i had posted in the in the facebook group that that, that i was doing that and um yeah, that uh, story, um, mostly as an audiobook, kind of just kept me busy from early December, and I finished it up like on New Year's Eve. Like, just I went past Christmas for me, but it took me right to the New Year. So that is always enjoyable. And now, um, my friend Francis Dow and I are reading Anna Karenina together. I mean, we're reading it independently. Um, we haven't even talked about it yet, but I assume that at some point we will talk about it. So on Amazon Classics, if you were um, if on Amazon Prime, if you remember, they have uh, books, all these these classes called Amazon Classics. And so I got the Kindle version and the Audible version for free. And so that's been very nice. And I can just, again, it's got the whisper sync so I can read it. And then when I'm running errands in the car, it'll just as an audiobook, pick back up where I left off. So um, that's been very nice. The It's a very good reader. Um, if it's on Audible, you know they are definitely picky about readers. And um, it's just nice to actually hear all the names pronounced correctly because my eyes glaze right over them, all those Russian names when um, when I read them. And the one thing that, you know, about reading the Russians is you just have to like get over that people are going to have the same name over and over. <laughs> the names change. They have shortened versions and long versions and a different version if you're male or female. And that really threw me. Um, maybe the first time I tried to read Anna Karenina, but definitely when I read Crime and Punishment. Um, but now I kind of know the lay of the land and I just kind of let it uh, flow over me. And if I'm like not sure who that name is, you know, the context clues, as the kids would say, are going to tell me who's talking. So so that's been good. It's funny because um, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I think of a long audiobook being like 14 or 15 hours. Um, I mean, that's yeah, like an Ann Patchett. Actually, Winter Solstice is 14 hours. Um Anna Karenina is over 38 hours. <laughs> so this one's going to keep me going for a while. I will probably have some sort of cozy mystery to read before I go to sleep at night just because um, it, it's not... Okay, I'm also surprised with Anna Karenina. It's 
not hard to understand. It's, um, you know, the, the story is very straightforward and funny. And um, yeah, it, I'm really enjoying it. it. It's not a hardship to read at all. And weirdly, I don't know a lot about the story. I think, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, classics, You even if you've never read them, you know the story. Although often I feel like what you think the story is from movies and things like that is not. This was definitely the case with um, when I read Dracula, when I read Frankenstein. The books are very, very different than what popular culture has turned them into. So anyways, um, I only know one thing about Anna Karenina and that's how it ends. Um, and so now I, you know, we'll find out why. <laughs> so that has been, um, uh, that's been definitely fun. And I'm fulfilling my uh, sort of long stated um, issue with myself that I don't read enough good books. Now, I mean, I read some good Ann Patches last year. I think Louise Penny are good books, but I feel like I could read better quality books because I do read a lot of lightweight, cozy mysteries. Um, so this is ticking that box for me um, in, for the first few months of this year, for sure. All right, let's move on to TV and movies. I actually have a, we, we watched a few movies, which is unusual for me. Um, we went to the theater and saw The Glass Onion. It was only out in theaters for a very brief time. It's a Netflix original movie, and then then it was on Netflix. So um, I think that was during Thanksgiving time. Chloe came home and said, I want to see this in the theater. So we all went, the whole family. It was great. It is such a fun ride. It is such a charming, <laughs> such a charming little mystery. Um, if you saw Knives Out, um, that was out a few years ago with Jamie Lee Curtis and, you know, all those people. And the, the detective is the, the common thread. It's a whole different mystery, but it's the same detective. And his name is Benoit Blanc, and it is played by Daniel Craig. And he is amazing. And so um, if you like Knives Out, you're going to love The Glass Onion. And then I, we actually watched it again on Netflix uh, during Christmas break. And I had one little issue with... Um, it when I saw it in the movies of course I had to share that with everyone I'm like okay this is the thing that doesn't make sense to me and um and there the people were like oh I didn't really think about that but when I saw it the second time I was like okay actually it makes sense so um it it's an all-star cast it's got um so we've got Daniel Craig is Benoit Blanc it's got Kate Hudson uh what's his name Edward Norton um oh Oh, what's his name? Leslie Odom Jr. I didn't even know that's who that was until the end. Um, some famous, very beefcake tattooed guy that I is famous, but I didn't know who he was. Um, and uh, what's her name? Janelle Monet, who I did not know who she was, um, but I do now, and she was fabulous. So um, it's about this really weird, eclectic group of friends that are getting together um, on this private island to... Um, kind of play a murder mystery party um, only there isn't actually a murder <laughs> so it, it kind of takes a different uh, spin so um, that was that was fun that was definitely fun and then we saw Daniel Craig in James Bond during the break I don't usually watch James Bond, James Bond movies but I was looking for something the whole family we have a hard time finding something the whole family wants to watch Glass Onion did fill that bill and it James Bond did in that none of us are into this <laughs> none of us are into James Bond but um it's action-packed they're funny you know it's you know you can kind of laugh at it and um and so that was actually very good too so there was um Daniel Craig in that and I don't apparently I have seen I guess I saw Skyfall which had Daniel Craig not into James Bond barely knew who Daniel Craig was but now I do so those were both fun and then also, probably on Netflix was the the Meyerowitz stories, which has um, uh, Adam Sandler and Dustin Hoffman um, as this, uh, this this dysfunctional family in New York City, and um, I guess that's all I really want to say. It it was just it was very good. It was very entertaining. You get get some real also all-star power there so that's the Meyerowitz stories um, so those are the movies that we watched um, also during this time since I talked to you last um, I watched the full Three Pines series which is based on the Louise Penny books as a matter of fact we had our watch party 
Um, it was very lightly attended. There was a, it was a cozy group of us, but it was so much fun to watch. We say, so we watched, um, the first, uh, episode, which is an hour long together. Like I was controlling it and we could chat, um, live and, and we, we basically just, you know, we're breaking down the casting, you know, the, the, the casting is good and bad, um. I was skeptical about Alfred Molina as a Gamash, but it turns out he was amazing. He's definitely a more um, casual Gamash, like he's he's wearing his little quarter zip-up sweaters as opposed to always the suit and tie that Gamash wears. Um, but I, I felt like he really captured the essence of, of him. And also on the good side of the casting, for those of you who haven't seen it, Ren Marie, his wife, I think is perfect. Um, Isabella, Isabella, Isabel, um, is also great. She's actually, um, I, I think she it, she it works very well. But she's actually um, native in this um, series, and, and she's not in the books, but it, it works perfectly. And she looks exactly the way as described. Who is completely wrong is Jean Guy, which is so sad to me. Jean Guy is completely wrong. He's too old. He's too gray. He's too rumpled. Um, we know Jean Guy as a very sharp dresser and stuff, and that is not who he is on the show. Um, and um, the the bistro owners Olivier and Gabri, Gabri, um, they're opposite of who they should be. And I noticed that when I first saw the one character, I said that better be Gabri, and it turned out to be Olivier. And I get Louise Penny's newsletter, and she kind of breaks down um, what is good and bad for her about the series. And she said, you know, there's some things that that just work better for television for, versus books. So she was kind of okay with some of the changes, but she's like, they just switched Olivier and Gabri. Like there was no reason to switch those characters of, of physically and, and who they are. It, it was it, so that kind of, she was kind of mess pissed off about that. And I don't blame her. So, um, and, and then some of the other villagers, um, I thought Ruth was good. Um, Myrna is not as described in the book, but I feel like she's fine. I feel like every time, so when we I watched the Three Pines movie from a few years ago, and this one and this show as well, Myrna is really cast to the side. She's has a much bigger role in the books, and I find that sad. And um, then, so who, who do you have left? We have Clara and Peter, and they're too young. And Peter's wrong, <laughs> but anyways, it doesn't matter. So I, um, I enjoyed it. It, they, it is different from the books. Three Pines is a darker place. It is not the beloved Three Pines that we all know and love from the books, but it still pretty much looks like it. It's very fun to look around the town and 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 just you know uh, square that with your own vision of Three Pines. Um, and the stories were great. So. Um, Basically, they're, I'm going to say they're sort of loosely based on the books. The last one was based on this book called The Hangman, which I've never read. It was like a short story, I believe, written as a literacy project um, thing by Louise Penny. So that was fun because I, I didn't know that story at all. But there's two episodes. They drop two episodes per week. Those two episodes together were basically one book, and they did four of those. So they covered four books, eight episodes in December. And I absolutely love them. I will watch them again. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly like, you know, my beloved books. Um, they are their own thing. And I very much appreciated those. So what else did I watch? Um, Magpie Murders. My friend Patty mentioned that to me. She's like, have you watched those? That's on PBS. It's a PBS mystery, masterpiece mystery. And I'd sort of had... Uh, remembered that, you know, I'm like, oh, I need to watch that and completely forgot. So I blew through those. Um, that is all, uh, yeah, that was so much fun. It was um, about a guy who writes murder mysteries and um, and his editor, who is a woman and something happens to the author and the editor is trying to solve the mystery. And so that was delightful. And since I was, and that's a, a PBS, so once I was on back on my PBS, I was like, what else is here that I haven't watched? And I had started Scarlet and the Duke, I mean, just barely, I, I don't know, a couple years ago, maybe, and it just didn't take with me. So I'm like, I'm, I need to revisit this. I'm totally loving Scarlet and the Duke. Um, and there are several seasons, and there's a new season coming out, and I am not quite caught up yet. But the premise of Scarlet and the Duke it takes place, oh gosh, I don't know, it seems like Victorian England times. And um, Scarlet 
has a father who is a private detective who is played by the actor from Downton Abbey, Mr. Mosley, the, the, the valet. And it took me a while because he's got all this facial hair and stuff in this one. And, and I figured it out from his voice. And then, of course, I had to look it up. So um, anyways, her father dies and she wants to take over this detective agency. And she, he's been sort of, um, you know, kind of prepping her for this her whole life. And um, so the problem is, is that she's a woman and nobody wants to let her be a private detective. Um, she has an old family friend who is the Duke and he is an inspector for Scotland Yard. And this is one of those cases where she keeps sticking her nose into cases where he does not want her help. But of course, her help is always invaluable. And so why that's Scarlet and the Duke. And there's a whole moonlighting, will they, won't they, <laughs> you know, definitely an attraction there, but they, they never seem to get anywhere with it. So, um, so that is really delightful. While we're talking PBS, there is a new season of All Creatures Great and Small coming out maybe today. I'm not exact, but in January. So I'm very excited about that. So if you haven't watched that, go back and watch the previous seasons there. Um, and there was also a Christmas episode for Call the Midwife. I don't even know if I've, I'm up to date with Call the Midwife or not, but I, I haven't watched that. I started it, but uh, I, I need to get back to that later. Okay, other Christmas episodes. They're on Acorn. I've talked about the Madame Blanc mysteries um, before, and they dropped uh, a Christmas episode. Bless the British for always having a Christmas episode. So that was delightful. And then last episode, I talked about that they were dropping the last season, season 10 of Doc Martin. I finished that and then thought I was really done and then found out that they were going to drop a Christmas episode at the end of December, which they did. And it really tied it all up so beautifully. So that was so much fun. And then my friend Stephanie from the Make and Decorate podcast texted me and said that if you bought it through Amazon Prime, there was a deal where you could get BritBox for $1.99 for two months. So of course I did. And BritBox is the one place that you can watch all of the episodes of Shetland. And I have bemoaned for years how after I, I got hooked on the show, it was probably on Netflix or Amazon Prime. I saw that I don't even know how many seasons I watched at first, um, but then you could just never get them anywhere. So um, I, I obviously did that. And I went back on Shetland to season four. I, and it didn't seem familiar, which I still could have watched it and it didn't seem familiar. So I started at season four and, um, you know, they're like six episodes each. And so I'm going to work my way through season seven. And I've already made the decision when I get through season seven, I'm going to go back <laughs> and watch the first three seasons. Um, so Shetland is a, a more of a Nordic noir style mystery show. It takes place um, on the Shetland Islands, which is, you know, north of um, Scotland and, and really quite near uh, Norway. And that kind of plays in in some episodes as well. And it is based on a book um, or the series of books um, by uh, Anne Cleves. And the, the detective there is Jimmy Perez. And he is um, brooding <laughs> <laughs> and thoughtful and smart and um these have been and they're they're kind of darker mysteries um so it's not light cozy, cozy fiction it's definitely a little bit that's why it's the nordic noir it's a little bit on the darker side um and then when i'm done with those um if, if i can get through that in in my two months here that i have it have brit box then i want to um, watch vera also based on a character by Anne Cleves. And those do exist in other places, different, just random seasons on Acorn and probably, you know, other places as well. Um, but I'm excited to, to have BritBox um, in addition to Acorn right now. I'm feeling really flush with my, <laughs> my British and Australian uh, mystery shows. So those are the, the shows that I watch while I'm stitching. And, um, but my husband and I, um, we kind of took a break from Designated Survivor that was talked about last time. And we started watching Wednesday when my son came home from school after finals. Um, he apparently binge watched a number of episodes of Wednesday because one of his roommates was completely uh, not... <laughs> <laughs> not studying for finals, was avoiding studying for finals because it turned out he was coming down with COVID, the roommate, not my son, um, and like watched the whole season in one day of Wednesday. And it was, you know, I, I knew it was a bit of a phenomenon. It's on Netflix 
Um, but you know, it just didn't really appeal to me, but he was like, I think you would actually like it. And it was so delightful. I got to tell you. Um, so if, uh, if you have no desire, if you think it would not be interesting to you, I, I, I beg to differ. And I even talked to my friend Vicky, who's also my age, a quilter over at, um, my creative corner three. And she also just recently started watching it and she's like, oh my gosh, this is such a fun show. So it was very, it's very cute. So that was fun. We just finished up that, um, the other day. And then we started watching with my son while he was here, um, Peaky Blinders, um, which is a British show. It's like a, it's, it's Breaking Bad, uh, the 1920s um, England, <laughs> in a way. Um, so it's definitely, it's, it's like an organized crime kind of thing. The Peaky Blinders is the name of their, you know, their family, the mob kind of. Um, and um, it is dark. It is violent. I, as a matter of fact, we're on season two right now, and I, my husband and I've made the decision when we're let's finish this season, um, and then let's take a break from it. It's got Sam Elliott in it as a um, as a like a detective that comes in to kind of um, well, it's to find a, a missing shipment of guns that involves the Peaky Blinders, um, and uh, so he he's great. He's got this great accent in it. But it is, um, it's dark and it's violent and it's, it's kind of hard to watch. But the story is great. It's, it's, I said, as we were watching, I'm like, this is worse than Breaking Bad, which I struggled with and have not watched all of Breaking Bad just because I couldn't handle um, the violence. Game of Thrones, same way. Um, and so this is, it's hard. But it is, um, if you can handle the gore, it is a really good story. Okay, so did, was that enough TV for the last six weeks? <laughs> As I suspected, we are already at an hour here. So let me um, wrap up with my final uh, segment here. And the first thing I wanted to let you know is that I am on um, episode 97, season five, ep episode 97 of Stephanie's um, Stephanie Socha's podcast called Make and Decorate. And I will put a link in the show notes. It's this December 15th episode. S Stephanie, I've talked about her before. She's an interior designer in addition to being a quilter and a knitter and all other sewist, all kind of crafty things. And she was helped me so much um, walking me through my bathroom renovation, helping me make decisions, help, giving me ways to look at things. It was amazing. So we... Um, talk about that project in addition to just all kinds of, of crafty stuff, um, including our love of uh, cozy mysteries and tea <laughs> and quilting and knitting and all the things. Um, so that was so much fun to record that. So I'll put a link in the show notes to that. Um, and I did just want to share, um, so we're coming into a new year. Last year, um, I had sort of these, uh, I, I approached the things that I wanted to get done in um, 2022 a little bit differently than I had in the past. I had like my big four goals, which was to lose weight, to plan a big family vacation, to renovate the master bathroom, and to grow a cutting garden. So I, I was batting 50% there. Um, the California drought took away my ability to really uh, do the cutting garden, um, did not make the progress. I started off with a bang on the weight loss and then kind of stalled out. Um, but the other two, I really... I really did accomplish and I loved having something so specific to focus on and for me to look at those I have them on a whiteboard by my desk and it's like what can I do this week to move these things along just one inch just one small thing so my three for this year are again I'm never going to give up on losing weight <laughs> and establishing a strength training routine so um, from a health perspective I want to, to do that I actually got an apple watch for Christmas and um it was kind of like my husband when he, he asked me if I wanted one. It, I had never really seriously considered it. And then I kind of did some research and watched some videos. And, and I have one now and I love it. Um, and I kind of, um, I got the, the Apple 8. It's in starlight and it has the matching starlight band. So it's kind of more a little bit more sophisticated looking. Um, and I have this very pretty analog face on it. Um, so it, that was, it was never kind of my style, but I've like, I turned it into my style, which was kind of fun, but it has such great metrics for fitness. Um, I am very motivated by things. So like closing my rings every day, um, like my watch is already telling me, um, like it, it, it very, uh, passive aggressively says, 
check your rings because by this point in the day on a weekday I would have already gotten all my exercise in and I haven't it's a Sunday morning I haven't gone for a walk yet um so I always think it's kind of funny where it just is like I get this little buzz on my wrist and this message that says check your rings <laughs> you're failing you better get going but anyway so I'm motivated by that it came with three months of a free Apple Fitness Plus which is kind of what it seems like a little bit like the Peloton app and um, I get out and do the cardio. That's no problem for me. Although um, now that I can see my heart rate and like how fast I'm walking, I have been inspired to walk faster. Over the years, my walk has slowed down to where it's more of a stroll where it used to be a very brisk walk. So I'm back to brisk walking because I can actually see on my wrist how fast I'm going. That it was helpful to me. And um, the Apple Fitness Plus um, app, which is synced up with my phone, with my watch, but also I just watch it, the class on my phone. They have these, um, these strength training classes that are like the very beginning. It's like 10 minutes and there's 15 of them. I'm like, this is perfect because if there's anything I need to do this year, it is start small and I don't enjoy this kind of workout. So 10 minutes is great. Uh, if I do two or three a week, you know, that'll last me a while. And then the the net, the 15, I could go back and do them if I wanted to. But then the next step up strength training class is 20 minutes. And um, so this seems like a really good way to get back into those class, those, that type of exercise that I know I need to do uh, because of my risk of osteoporosis. And um, I think one of the things that I learned is that I, I really do better for the type of exercise that I don't like, strength training, if someone is literally telling me what to do. Following a video works for me. When I was doing the Paula B, um, I, I liked that for, the, for that exact reason. My only problem with Paula B is that it's kind of an all over workout for her. And I, I just, for the video part, I just want strength. I don't want to do cardio in the house and, and things like that. So, um, so that has been really good. I'm like, I, I, I've told you I've bought books and all kinds of programs to try to get me to do weights. But I think just having someone to tell me what to do may work. And it's like $10 a month after the first three months. So that we'll see. We'll see. It's early days. I'll, I'll try to keep you up on that. So the first one is to, to lose some weight and establish a strength training routine. The second one is to um, our two kids rooms. Um, we I need to redo them. They need to be uh, sort of repaired and repainted, and we need um, new furniture in both rooms to reflect how we live today, um, and so that they are are better guest rooms um, for when the kids come home. I mean, Ben still lives here, even though he's at college. He needs a, a good room to come back to, and and it's everything's a bit of a mismatch. We still have bunk beds, all kinds of things like that. So, I'm um, getting those things done this year. And then my third one is what I'm calling prepping. And that is, I've talked about it before, but it's um, making sure that, here, here's the objective, that we could live for two weeks if we lost power and we couldn't really get to a grocery store. Could we live comfortably for two weeks at our house? Um, so we've purchased a, a generator. We have a water stored now. Ever since COVID, I've really been... Um, growing what I'm going to call our extended pantry um, so that I just don't have to go to the grocery stores often. And so part of that is I wanted to get that more organized. And so over the Christmas break, my husband and I got into the garage and we cleaned things out and reorganized things. We bought these hanging shelves, kind of like a platform. We have three of them now in the garage for extra storage. Um, and a lot of that is Christmas stuff. So we never have to go back in the attic to get Christmas stuff, which is a huge pain in our house. So that's wonderful. But it's also just creating space in the garage um, so that I have places to store um, this, this you know, extra food. And I've learned some lessons along the way as we've worked our way through this. And I, I bought a bunch of like canned soup one year. Like, okay, we don't really eat canned soup, but if... Um, that was the only thing we had. We'd be happy we had it. It turns out that doesn't really work. It just goes bad. I, I always think, okay, we'll, we'll use it, but we don't. So we, I had some expired food. So I'm really learning to um, just keep extras of what we really use and to make sure that we have like all components for, for a, you know, a meal. So anyway, so that's, that's going to be... Um, my my focus for this year also so I, I bought this book i talked about it in the past called survival mom and it has a super cringy 
cover and and she definitely has these different levels of preparedness and and I'm not I'm not I'm not preparing for society to collapsing if we know it but we do live in a place where we um we get blackouts we have fire we have flood we have earthquakes so I just want to make sure that we are in a in good position for that when those things happen including evacuating and having a bag a a go bag, you know, ready to go. If we had to evacuate, we could get out quickly. So those are my three things. And I'm kind of excited to, uh, you know, work on those and, um, and we'll see, uh, where I get this year. All right. Um, there were no reviews. Um, but if you care to leave a review over at uh, Google or Apple podcast, um, rate and review the podcast. I always love to love it when you guys do that and it does help other people to find the um the podcast thank you so much for all the support you guys have given me um over the years here we're coming up on five years of the podcast which is just absolutely crazy and um you guys just make it so so fun for me so i just thank you from my bottom the bottom of my heart for that i hope you guys have a wonderful new year And as always, uh, everything I talk about is in the show notes online at kristenesser.com or just Google Simple Handmade Every Day. If you're looking for a link that I forgot to post because I make big promises while I'm recording, just reach out to me in any of the numbers of ways that you can do that on um, the blog, on Instagram, where I'm also Kristen Esser. And please consider joining the Simple Handmade Every Day Facebook group so that we can keep the conversation going. Have a wonderful week.